Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Today, I'm going to be presenting on resource capacity planning and talking you through how CEDAR is modernizing their resource capacity planning capabilities. Our vision for the resource capacity planning program is to develop a unified and trusted resource management capability to foster innovation and maximize our operational performance, facilitating a flow of products to patients first in the world in order to protect and promote public health and meet our commitments to the American public. What does this mean? This means that we want to make sure that we have the right resources in place to review submissions as we get them to make sure that we are providing safe and effective drugs to the American public in a timely manner. How are we going to do this? What is our resource capacity planning capability? This starts with the goal of identifying the resources we need before we need them. To start this program, the first thing we did was modernize our time reporting. We transitioned to 52 weeks a year time reporting so that we could provide a better measure of the level of effort of all of our employees and a better analysis of what hours are available to work. The idea of having a modernized time reporting system is that we have something that is flexible and capable of capturing all that time reported. Concurrently, we also began developing workload forecasting. This is the advanced analytics to forecast the likely work coming to the center. We combined this with information we know about operational data, so information about attrition, hiring times, financial data, to develop a comprehensive resource forecast to really look at our projected demand compared to our available staff by role. So looking forward in this chart from FY18Q1, where we might need to be in FY20Q4 in terms of staff on board and how we can meet that need. When we begin to apply these resource forecasts to how we can meet that need, there are a couple of areas that we look at. The first area is capacity balancing, looking at what's currently happening from what we understand in our internal time reporting processes to be able, be able to identify areas that we can prioritize our existing resources to support offices that have a higher demand. As we begin to understand those areas that have a higher demand, we also are forecasting the work in those areas. And we can take that forecasted information and begin to make sure that we have the funding we need to support that work. So that would be a revenue adjustment by the ability to adjust our fees or by asking for more budgetary authority from Congress. Once we know that we have those funds available, we can then start to formulate hiring plans to bring those resources on board to the center. And as we bring those resources on board, we can then turn to financial forecasting and understanding how we are spending our money across our payroll to make sure that we have and are forecasting where that those dollars are going. For the FDA, we have developed a very specific methodology First, we're looking at our forecasted workload, so our work across the different submission um, review submission categories, so NDAs, INDs, supplements, meetings, understanding the work for direct review activities that's coming to the center, and then understanding the amount of time those different types of work take. So looking at historical time reporting data, historical submission volume data, and beginning to develop the time a submission takes based off of our time reporting so that we have a level of effort. For our direct review effort, we can use these direct um, level of efforts, the amount of time a task take. For some of our non-direct review activities, we're looking at trend analysis or information about the activity that might help us forecast the amount of time it will take. To do that, we then combine those two areas and we generate the resource forecast. These are algorithms that we apply to estimate the submission volumes so that we can generate a demand across all of the offices in the center and across the FDA. 
As we continue to refine our resource capacity planning capabilities, there are some things that we want to highlight that we, as, as key achievements. I think the first thing I'll highlight is across the board, we have continued to increase our automation and quality control to make sure that we have the best quality data included in our forecasts, in our time reporting, to make sure that we have as much automation to increase the amount of time we have for innovation and improvements across the board. In workload forecasting, we're on our second generation of workload models, and we were able to, be, from our first generation, identify and implement improvements to both the Padufa and Vasufa workload models. We also use Gadufa for internal resource planning processes, and so we've continued to refine the predictive models for Gadufa. In terms of Insight Time Reporting, which is our modernized time reporting system, we've continued to support accuracy and compliance. So we've made sure that we've provided trainings and communications to supervisors, to, to all staff, to make sure that they have the confidence to properly report time and have the confidence on how to confirm that time has been properly reported. And of course, we've also spent a lot of time making sure that we understand our resource utilization. So we've developed a set of operational dashboards to make sure that it is clear to us and to our users how resources are getting utilized and the effort to different organizational priorities. A key area I'll highlight here is because we have a flexible time reporting system, we were able to introduce coronavirus activity codes to make sure that we could review and collect that time spent on activities towards COVID-19 so that we could take that time and report it to our stakeholders so that they could see our efforts across all of the activities. This has been key in providing data in weekly reports um, to OMB. And so having that flexibility in our time reporting system has been critical in allowing us the to, to capture and share this information and also to ensure our staff that their work is getting recognized on the pandemic and in these trying times. In terms of resource forecasting, we've continued to refine the resource forecasting algorithms based off of our growing time reporting data set. We have we started these algorithms with one year of time reporting data. And in our most recent research, refresh, we had two and a half years of time reporting data. So our data set is really growing and increasing, allowing us to have a better understanding of the algorithms and really what the capabilities are. We've also started to use these resource forecasts to make sure that we're supporting resource requests and resource needs and operations across the center so that they have the information they need when making requests to understand and to ensure that those requests will meet the future needs of the different super offices. When we talk about implementing and operationalizing resource capacity planning, where it all has to start is data ingestion. We have to start with bringing our regulatory submissions, our time reporting, all of that information, whether it be through PDFs, APIs, Excel spreadsheets, into the, into the system so that we can start to clean the data, standardize the data, quality control, check the data, and really prep the data to be brought into our algorithms. Once we have all of this data, we then make sure that our current algorithms match the data we have and make sure that all of our data prep and, and cleaning really matches our algorithm. We then use those algorithms to resource forecast. And then we combine those resource forecasts with our advanced analytical modeling where we're predicting our regulatory submissions. And we bring that together with data integration where we in bring our forecast and our predictions and all that supporting data together to understand our adjustments to user fees. And then of course, a key goal of all of this is that as we understand our adjustments to user fees, we have the ability to visualize and report those data. 
A key portion of success of our resource capacity planning project is in process is ensuring that we have pipeline automation for the algorithm engine. What that means is that we're streamlining the resource forecast, workload forecast, and capacity planning adjustments to make sure that we're providing transparency of those models to the end user. The first part I'm going to cover here is actually the QC model, which is implemented through each phase of the algorithm engine to ensure that we've streamlined the QC project process with automated logics and taxonomy files so that we can consistently track throughout each phase outputs and inputs. It all begins at the extract, transform, and load module where we're providing the standardized data extraction, cleaning, and mapping process to create common data sets that can be used by our workload forecasting and resource forecasting modules downstream. The forecast module integrates the workload forecast volume and the resource forecast to provide that automated FTE or full-time equivalent forecast. The CPA module then takes that FTE forecast, and it instead looks at a user fee capacity planning adjustment specific resource forecast results and wor workload forecasting volume, and it takes that and translates it into an output for a managerial decision. When we're talking about the managerial decision, what we're talking about is the second step in our process for the capacity planning adjustment. The adjustment methodology we're going to talk about was reviewed by an independent third party prior to its implementation, and it's the same process that's currently in progress for the FY22 CPA. We start by our forecasting our resource needs for direct review efforts. This is generating algorithm-based resource forecasts for those direct review offices by user fee allocation, looking at user fee specific work and time needs to determine user fee specific resource demands. Once we've developed those user fee specific resource demands, it's essential that we also assess the feasibility of acquiring those needed resources. So we adjust the forecast for a number of internal operational factors. First thing we want to check is, is this workload sustainable? Do we anticipate or forecast that this workload will maintain over more than one year? If we don't anticipate that this workload will maintain, we might not need to hire that level of resources because they won't have that same level of demand in future years. We also need to understand our hiring capability. Can we bring the forecasted number of people on board within the time frame that the CPA, CPA is looking at? Do we have the capability to hire this many people within a year? And what are our current existing vacancies? So are we forecasting for additional resources where we already have vacancies of, in that space? If so, we probably won't need to make that adjustment because we already know that that funded gap is there. And then of course, there are additional financial considerations. Do we have office space, computers, technology to support these new hires as they come on board? Once we know what that adjustment is and how we can adjust our forecasted amount to what is feasible, we can then take that final feasible count of FTEs and convert those to a dollar amount and add those do that dollar amount to the inflation adjusted annual target revenue so that we are incorporating that resource demand in the setting of our user fees for future years. This is a major improvement upon our previous CPA methodology. Our previous CPA methodology was specific to PDUFA, and it utilized a lagging indicator of upcoming submission volumes through a three-year retrospective average. So if I was in preparing for FY20, 
CPA adjustment, I'd actually look, I'd still be in FY19, so I wouldn't have a full year of data. So I'd be looking at FY18, FY17, and FY16, and using a three-year average of those data points to forecast my resource need. And we didn't translate that volume into an expected resource demand. So we had a really retrospective lagging indicator that wasn't accounting for the demand of performing that work in future years. As we've adjusted to this new methodology, we're utilizing a forward-looking advanced analytical models to predict future workload. We have a team of data scientists, economists, industry experts, machine learning experts who are working together to understand both internal and external data and how it can help us forecast work coming to the center. It then incorporates time reporting and submission data to really calculate that future expected effort needed to perform the work. So we're really making sure that we have the people on board to do the work that is expected to coming, come to the center. We are continually improving this process. It is a new process to the center. And as additional data and insights become available, both on the workload side and on the time reporting side, we are refining and improving our methodology. Looking forward, we are working to enable, embed, and utilize these resource capabilities in operations. We really want to take these models and algorithms and continue to enhance them. We want to then make sure that we have the framework and methodology to translate these, um, these outputs into operational processes at FDA. We want to make sure that these forecasts we're developing are getting used by CEDAR to help make better resourcing decisions or to improve the strength of the already existing resource decisions. We are then refining our processes and related roles and responsibilities to make sure that we can properly maintain and utilize these capabilities, training people and working with people across the center to really have the confidence in the outputs and of course, a key aspect of all of this is improving the technical environment and design and deployment. We want to make sure that we are designing and deploying resource capacity planning capabilities in a scalable technical environment so that we can have the flexibility and efficiency as we continue to enhance the overall algorithm engine. That's what I have you today. I really appreciate your time. I hope that you learned something about what we're doing to improve our resource capacity planning capabilities. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your time and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Allison. We appreciate your time. And just a note to the audience, if you have questions for Allison today, you can go ahead and put them into the Q&A chat pod. And with that, we'll get started with our first question. Allison, what kind of reviews are done to confirm the accuracy and completeness of time reporting? That's a great question. One of the things we do with time reporting is we run regular compliance checks, which are a simple check to ensure that people are entering their hours into the system. So we have a measure of tour of duty, which is people's expected time they should be entered in the system. And we confirm that those tour of duties are met when they've entered their time for a pay period. Additionally, one of the things that we have done is that just entering your time isn't accurate. We know that they, there are many ways that people work. And so one of the things we have done is we've done trainings for supervisors where supervisors are able to stop and look at their employees' time reporting to ensure that those employees are reporting accurate time. We've also developed some automated dashboards that allow supervisors and offices as a whole to see how time has been reported and check for anomalies or areas where there might be instances 
that time is being reported in a way that is unexpected. We've also tried to ensure that we have captures in the system for things that might be inconsistent that we can capture with an automated check. So we have every pay period, we run a dashboard that checks for time reported that is outside of the expected norm. So we compare it to the previous pay periods, we compare it to the previous year, and we stop to make sure that that time is matching the expected reported for that, for that pay period and activity. It's a continual process to confirm accuracy and uh, compliance, and I think that we'll continue to improve on it as time goes on. But the hope is that where we are right now is a good place to start. Thank you. Great, thank you, Allison. We appreciate that. And our next question for you is, what is the benchmark used to say that the workload forecasting is successful? That is also an excellent question. One of the things that we've had to do with the workload forecasting is we've had to develop these forecasts to understand what resources are coming to the center. And so as we've developed these forecasts for, for workload, one of the things that we've had to confirm is that these workload forecasts are better than what we used previously. Our, what we previously used was a three-year rolling average. I mentioned that during the presentation, but as we've developed these workload forecasts, one of the things that we've worked to do is estimate how those workload forecasts are doing in comparison to the three-year average. So we have a time period that we use to train our data, and then we use that, or our, our machine learning models, we use that trained model to then forecast a test period of time. We compare that forecasted test period of time to what the three-year average would be for that test period of time to confirm that our models are outperforming that historic three-year average. I hope that answers your question and also makes sense. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, that's a great answer. All right, so with that, we have another question for you. What are the benefits of resource capacity planning for the FDA outside of the potential to adjust user fees to account for increased resource demand? Thank you for the question. I think this question gets to the bigger picture of how these data can be used. As we're understanding more about information and how people are spending their time, there are many aspects in which we can take these data and apply them to the center as a whole. We can apply these data to better understand how tasks might impact the outcome of work. So if there's a large increase or an unexpected increase in an area, let's use the current example that we're all living, the pandemic, we can see the impact of the pandemic on other areas of people's work. So as we're working through this pandemic, we can see the transitions in what work is being performed and how much time that work is taking so that we can begin to understand the total impact of not only the pandemic on people's direct review work, but the impact of the pandemic on the other areas that people are participating in their workload. So not only in the direct review activities, but on the impact of policy guidance activities. We can also begin to understand the changes in how that work spiked. So as the pandemic, as the public health emergency was declared, we were able to track how people changed their time reporting habits so that we could see as the pandemic normalized into people's working habits, what it looked like in their time reporting. And it became a very effective tool for the center in planning how resources were going to be impacted so that we could understand better moving forward in the pandemic, the overall scale and impact of the workload. And so that's a small microcosmic example of how these data can start to be utilized by the center, by an office to understand the burden of workload as activities move forward. Thank you again for that question. 
Great, thank you, Allison. Another question for you. Would you say that load forecasting is successful? So I believe this is a question about whether workload forecasting is successful. In my experience, I do believe that workload forecasting has been successful. I believe that it has given us the ability to start predicting work coming to the center. It is a complex forecasting mechanism. I believe there's a lot of information available, but our experts are able to pull data across the board from internal data that the FDA has and maintains to external data about many different factors that might go into uh, a workload forecast. And having that all combined really does build out, in my opinion, to a forecast that is in many ways much more successful than a three-year average. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Allison. And we have one last question for you. When was Insight Time Recording reporting released, and how is the modernized time reporting being accepted across the center? And as an additional question, do the other centers have something similar? That is an excellent question. So the modernized time reporting system, Insight, was released to the CEDAR in March of 2019, so halfway through the government fiscal year of FY19. This system was initially built by CEDAR for this very purpose, but it has been rolled out to other centers through in the last two years. So it was rolled out to CDRH and FY20, and I believe it has rolled out to another center in FY21. So Insight as a tool has been rolled out across multiple centers over the years. But we have also, there are other centers that have internal time reporting systems. So our, um, our partner office, our center, the Center for Biologics, CBER, has their own time reporting system that they've built that also captures time reporting. So across the center or across the agency, there are many systems that capture time reporting. For CEDAR, as we rolled into Insight time reporting, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that this transition to a full time reporting system was as successful as the use of our previous sample of time reporting data. So before Insight time reporting began, we used eight weeks of time reporting a year, and we've now moved to a full time reporting system. The goal of this rollout was to bring people on board to a 95% compliance within the first six months of rollout. So by the end of the fiscal year, we actually met that goal for compliance within the first two months of the system rollout. So we far exceeded our goals and we really have seen that that compliance has consistent, cons persisted throughout the years. And we've seen that compliance improve throughout the years. And so I think with consistent messaging and consistent communications, we are seeing not only consistent use, but increased accuracy and compliance across the board. Thank you again for the question. Great, thank you so much, Allison, for your time and answering so many questions and explaining this to our audience. And with that, we want